some sort of, well, in a gasification situation, you always have some sort of fire that is producing the CO2 and water vapor. And when we burn something, we oxidate something, uh, either a fossil fuel or, or a biomass, the product of that is, there's two products, carbon dioxide and water vapor, okay, um, and heat. So if we have a, a combustion situation coupled with this, we are going to have that CO2 and water vapor at very high temperatures. Okay, and that's in fact how you're getting the heat into the charcoal bed, is it's coming in with the CO2 and water vapor. Um, and it can also come into the charcoal bed through other methods of actually directly heating the charcoal. Um, but you really want to be doing it on both sides. Okay? And what happens in other urban environments that not oxygen? Well, the oxygen has already been completely, or has been combusted um, in pyrolysis. You bring in some amount of oxygen, you burn the, the, the gases to CO2 and water vapor. There's no more oxygen. And when you run that CO2 and, and, and uh, H2O across the charcoal bed, um, the charcoal bed is reactive with the oxygen, so it pulls the oxygens off of those two molecules. Um, and in the case of the CO2, what it's really trying to do is, is attach an oxygen to all the available carbon sites. And being that there's an essentially infinite number of carbon sites, it can't complete. Okay? It, it can't ever fill those up. So it just it keeps pulling them off, and as it pulls it off, it makes CO, and the CO is now a gas, so it, it comes off of the charcoal. So you're pulling the charcoal apart also as you're doing this. You're always reacting on the surface. Okay? So that's why when you get to CO, you don't get to, to C or CO2. So essentially distributing the oxygen to the maximum um, extent possible. Okay? Because the oxygen would rather be monatomic on the C than it would be diatomic on the on the Rather than the two of them hanging on to the C, the, the, the char pulls one. Right. Do you have a way to ensure that the input doesn't have tar in it that can poison the charcoal bed or can't go down to things? Can you get that tar level down to nearly really Well, that's, that's, the, um, that's the engineering challenge. Okay. And you can fail catastrophe, you can fail spectacularly, or you can do it well, or anything in between. Okay. So, um, the problem that we'll get into here a little down, downstream is that it's more complicated than just burning all the tar gas. Um, Biomass, if you look at the proportions of fixed carbon to volatiles, you have way more volatiles than fixed carbon. Um, you, uh, biomass is about, on average, 80% volatiles, 20% fixed carbon. And if you do the mass balance in this, you can't completely burn all of the, the pyrolysis gases, or you'll have way too much CO2 and water vapor for the available char. Okay? So biomass was poorly designed for what we needed in the gasifier. If we were redesigned biomass, we're going to change the, the composition of it such that it has more fixed carbon and less volatiles. Or we choose plant materials for gasifiers that actually have better ratios there, which you can do. Okay? This is one reason why coal gasifiers are so much easier to operate than a biomass gasifier. Because coal is, to an approximation, the reverse. It's 80% fixed carbon, 20% volatiles. So you can completely burn off all of the volatiles after your pyrolysis process and not have to deal with this excess. But the core problem in a biomass gasifier is we can only uh, burn a part amount of those, those volatiles um, and then we have to crack the rest of them through heat. Okay, so we aren't fully combusting uh, the pyrolysis gases uh, in the combustion stage. We're partially combusting and then trying to, to create enough heat for enough resonance time to break the, the rest of those, those tar molecules apart just with heat. That's what we call cracking. So that's the challenge inside a gasifier and why they become so fuel sensitive. They're trying to create the environment where you can have this cracking process going on because of your excess tars. And there's actually, um, by volume, there's more cracking going on than there is actually combustion. We should really add more accurately call the combustion zone in a gasifier a cracking zone. So this is why they become so famously sensitive. It's because you have to get this cracking process working correctly. And it's happening down in all of the void space between the charcoal. And the charcoal is trying to react with your, your, your just made combustion gases. And as soon as you make those combustion gases, the reduction reactions start. And that pulls energy out of the environment, which makes your cracking more difficult. Okay. Is this so, cracking the same as an oil refinery? Absolutely. Yeah. What is cracking exactly? Well, all molecules are atoms bonded together, and as you add heat, you can get to energy states in the heat environment that, that, that those, those, 
those um, bonds fail. So they become apart. smaller. Yeah, they go. I mean, by adding heat, you can ultimately reduce any molecule back to its atomic constituents. So, this is the magic in a gas. Would you prepare your fuel? Could you supplement your fuel with extra carbon? So, if you put your biomass, it just plug up a bunch of coal in there, a little, you know, whatever it takes. Yeah, I mean, if you have it, you can, but I mean, most of us are trying to work with the waste biomass that we have around, so the challenge is to redesign the reactors so that they don't have these problems, and that can be done already. Right. Oh, it is being done. That's what we're doing here. Is that the So, I mean, you can choose your problem here. You can either take on the fuel preparation problem and get the fuel to a perfect state of shape, size, moisture content, mixture of species, such that an, uh, an existing reactor will work, okay? Or you can take on the problem of the reactor and make it such that any fuel will work in it or some range of fuel that's practical. Or you can say, well, I'm not going to deal with any of that, um, and I'm going to run an improper fuel into a reactor that doesn't really deal with the situation, and then I'm going to take up a huge, take on a big gas cleanup train downstream to fix the problem there. Okay, and what you typically end up in, in projects is they do some combination of all three and maximize the footprint, cost, and complexity of the whole thing, <laughs> such that it crashes. Okay, yeah, get so, enough venture funding. You do anything. What? If you get enough venture funding. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's easier to harvest venture funding if you have a good PowerPoint and there's lots of exactly. processes. So if it's simple, it doesn't look as good. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, it should be nice. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you assume that the reactor is a, is a standard historic gasification reactor, you have to take on some significant fuel pre-processing. And in most cases, you're going to have some significant gas, gas cleanup training. So what most gasification projects, they seem simple, is just this reactor, a couple of steel tanks in the middle does this fancy thing, put junk in it and you get products out. In practice what they become in the end is these huge fuel um, preparation projects and then the gas cleanup projects that deal with the problems that didn't happen in the reactor. So by the end of it, those two things become much larger than the raw gasifier. Okay. So, and we found again and again that the cost of doing that, the complexity, the physical footprint, of, of operating it on that becomes a plant scale problem. Yeah, you can do that at the industrial scale, a really utility scale, but if you're trying to get these to personal scale energy devices, you can't take on all those liabilities. You have to have something that can operate compactly that doesn't create these other problems. So, I mean, the core thing that we're doing is, is showing how you can solve all these problems in the reactor through better engineering and control and um, new designs and in well integrate the heat between the engine and the gasifier, um, and so you don't need to take on a huge gas, gas cleanup project. In fact, you can do a very simple packed bed filter, not even a water filter situation, which, well, I mean, the most successful gasifiers to date are the Angkor are scientific ones in India, um, and all of those designs are working with a relatively high tar gasifier um, that are then, then doing a large water cleanup train after that and all the projects end up with a big black slurry pond around them, which is a huge issue. So as they get a little larger, then they take on a, a whole other process to deal with the slurry pond. Okay. So it, it, if you're going to try to make these on the appliance model, the personal scale, this is a washing machine, you stick stuff in, you've got to solve the problems in the core of the gasifier, okay, and not propagate the problems outward. And the good thing is that that work wasn't really completed back then in, the, in, in World War II and all that. There's still some improvements to be made. Oh, yeah. That's what's cool about it. Because yeah. they didn't perfect it, now you can. Yeah, well, I'm shocked that this hasn't been solved. It was sitting there unsolved, and it's very solved. So, um, and when you have the solution in, you can build it out of junk with your MIG welder. So, um, we, should, we should only be lucky to have this interesting problems elsewhere. Okay, so the magic of a, of a gasifier are the reduction reactions. Um, we should think of it as the op opposite of oxidation. We're stripping the, the, the oxygens off of combustible molecules. 
or the products of combustion, CO2 and water vapor, returning them to a, a, a fuel gas. Um, that process takes energy to do it. It's endothermic. It's the opposite of oxidation where we're, we're releasing energy as we burn. Okay? So this is really one of the things that makes gasifiers actually work, is that reduction is an equal and opposite reaction of oxidation. So the degree to which you burn something, you'll get an equal and opposite reduction of those combusted gases if you have a charcoal environment. Okay? So you can literally take a, a pipe, fill it, you know, fill it with charcoal, start burning on one end, and to the degree to which you propagate combustion, you'll get an equal and opposite propag propagation of reduction. Okay? So this is what allows them to be self-regulated. You can, you, know, you can increase or decrease the, the gas speed through there, or the oxygen in, and you will expand or contract your, your combustion zone, and you'll similarly expand or contract your reduction zone. It's self-regulating, as long as you're not adding any other oxygen into the system. Yeah, and from your beginning, did you, was it necessary to experiment with different types of uh, these modules and how they fit together, the size of the holes and stuff, to have more control over the various processes? Uh, now, just to make it simple, I mean, if you, right here, I'm looking at about a five inch diameter hole on this. If it was seven, it, would it affect the process? Well, that's more on the mechanical side. I mean, the problem in a gasifier is it's, it, it's not a single variable, and we'll get, we'll get to that through, through here in a little bit. It's, a, it's really a three dimensional puzzle that involves uh, thermal, chemical, mechanical, and gravimetric issues. And you're trying to solve these four, these four, four problems simultaneously. And unfortunately, their solutions, or their optimal solutions, their ideal solutions, are in no way parallel. And I'll, I'll show you some slides here in the end that actually formalize those about what relationships you would like to have thermally and chemically. And you see that they aren't the same at all, which is the beginning of the problem of designing the gasifier. It's trying to figure out how to get those things back in line. And the size of the hole in that really relates to a, a, a mechanical issue. Solid fuels are difficult to move. I mean, there's a reason we use liquid fuels. Um, they're very simple to store. They're simple to, to, to pump, valve, control. Um, gas is a little less so, but I mean, solids are famously difficult to transport. The solid materials handling world is a completely separate animal than the, the plumbing world of moving, of, of moving liquids. And, the gas world kind of combines with the liquid world. But solid material handling, I mean, there's all the same pumps, valves, diverters, check valves, you know, all of those functions we have in the solids world, but they're, <laughs> they're big machines that are difficult and they get stuck, and it's, it's not an easy problem. Okay? So yes, there's been a lot of work deciding the size of that hole and how to move things through. And that's the minimum we think we can get away with. Okay, so. Uh, four processes, drying, pyrolysis, um, combustion, and reduction. In an actual reactor, these go, go together in different ways. And we're now going to go through the, the, the core types of reactors. The most simple, simple way to, to look at these in an actual uh, reactor situation um, would be a charcoal gasifier. Uh, if you would imagine a closed vessel, um, this is the, kind of like the pipe example. In a closed vessel, we fill with charcoal, have some provision to bring air in the bottom and pull gas off the top. This, again, this is a closed vessel. Um, all of these pro processes uh, assume that you, you're controlling where the oxygen is coming in and not allowing it to come in randomly in other places. So it's very different than a, cap a campfire. It is a controlled oxidation environment. So if you bring air into the bottom of, a, uh, of the sealed vessel, um, combust some amount of the, the charcoal in there, you'll get that combustion zone propagating forward until you run out of oxygen. That burning process produces CO2, water vapor, and heat. Those propagate forward, um, heat the charcoal ahead of it. So at the point at which we run out of oxygen, the reactions will reverse and start sucking that energy um, out of the heat um, back into chemical energy in the form of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Okay? So the, 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 separate, the transition between the combustion and reduction zone and a charcoal bed is really the point at which you run out of oxygen. There isn't any formal vessel change or line or anything. It is the dynamic point where you finish combustion and you have a ton of heat but no more oxygen. And now that CO2 and water vapor that was produced through the combustion is now going to reduce over the charcoal and go back to hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Okay? 
So this is a problem we get into with a, with a wood stove in a house, where we, we know if you have a you know, wood stove heater, you get the thing burning really hot, you got a lot of